at least physically, that like zombies were chasing me. Like that's how scared I got. So thinking again, like if you can make someone really feel and experience like they're somewhere else on the impact side, that could be really, really powerful. Welcome to Building Better Worlds. Our mission here is simple, to explore how the innovations of Web3 can deliver on its potential to build a sustainable, more equitable world. Welcome to this episode of Building Better Worlds. Today we have a special guest, Sarah Porter, the Director of Innovative Philanthropy, Hope for Haiti. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So let's, let me ask, what made you, I've been reading about you, what made you go into um, philanthropy and civil work? Yeah, I guess it's something I've always just been interested in. Um, maybe even just growing up, my mom was always very involved in community service and volunteering. I really do think that had a formative effect on me. Um, right. And in college, I started to think about the Peace Corps. And at the time, I really didn't even know exactly what that entailed. But I think I was attracted to, you know, the living abroad, the excitement, again, that community right. service angle, but also just seeing a world bigger than myself and, and knowing that I was also going to be getting probably so much more out of it than what I was able to give, but really okay. seeing like how I could develop my skills, you know, going forward. And um, it turned out to be one of the best decisions I ever made. It was such a formative experience, something that today, years later, almost decades later, uh, <laughs> tends to just, yeah, just be this really meaningful experience I was able to have. So you joined the Peace Corps really young, right? Um, and you went abroad and you started serving out there. What was kind of like your biggest experience over there that, that touched you that to this day you can remember? Yeah, honestly, I think it might be that I'm still in contact um, with my host sister so many years later. So I was very young. I mean, looking back, it seems very young. I was 23 when I went over there, still kind of felt like a child. No, nope, but actually, no, I take that back. When I was 23, I definitely thought I knew what I was doing. And then it was kind <laughs> of a, a wake up call to realize, Sarah, right, you don't know anything. And I remember the Peace Corps telling us, like, don't have any expectations. You know, it's going to be very different than you imagine. They tried to explain something called culture shock. And I remember again, hey, I'm 23. Um, I know everything. I'm going to be fine. And then a couple months in, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is exactly what they were warning <laughs> us about during our, our staging. Um, but I was fortunate enough to be placed with a wonderful host family. So the way... Um, Peace Corps is typically set up. It's not everyone's experience, but you live with a host family for your first three months to really help get integrated um, to the culture, to the community, to the language. And then after that, you're moved to your, um, your placement for the next two years. So I lived with a family and my host sister, Vicki, was 12. And very fortunate for me, Vicki was learning English in school. Um, I was in the Republic of Macedonia and... You know, you, you learned Macedonian, which was a language I knew nothing about. They used the Cyrillic alphabet. That was also something I had to learn. Um, so Vicky really was my translator and my navigator um, culturally, you know, linguistically. She led me around town. She helped me buy food. And um, to this day, oh gosh, how many years have I been back now? I don't even know if I want to say, but she is well into her mid to late 20s and we are still Pen pals. I actually just got a letter from her a couple days ago. And it, it's really meant a lot to me to, I think, the human to human connection and to really see her grow and develop over the years and just turn into this strong, intelligent, just wonderful person. Um, I was able to actually see her in Germany a few years ago. She's she's also living abroad and to see her as a as a young woman. Um, and I was like, last time I saw you. You were 12 <laughs> and you were like right. showing me how to buy a sandwich. Right. <laughs> and then she led me around Germany speaking German and also helping me buy sandwiches <laughs> because I was like, I don't know any German. Um, well, that's quite yeah, an that's experience. Mm -hmm. All right. So then from the Peace Corps, you, you've you risen up to being board, direct, board president of the New York Peace Corps Association, uh, which I believe has over a thousand members. So what kind of impact does that organization have in New York? Yeah, so actually when I got back from the, the Peace Corps, one of the reasons I um, was one of the 
became one of the co-founders of the New York City Peace Corps Association is we really wanted to see a strong alumni network in the New York City area. So when people, you know, serve abroad like me and then they move somewhere like New York, there's this there's this group that you can that you can work with, that you can connect with, you know, helping our members. Um, that's what we have in common. We all served in the Peace Corps. We all had, you know, very different experiences. We served in different places. Yet there's this one thing that really connects us and we have in common, no matter where you serve. And again, no matter how different your experience was, there are things that we could all relate to as former Peace Corps volunteers. So making sure that our members have this, um, this network to come back to, you know, we help return Peace Corps volunteers, find jobs, <laughs> you know, find housing, find friends, <laughs> we do events. Community service tends to be something um, that we all want to continue doing. So we do volunteer projects. You know, part of it is storytelling. Um, we organize uh, an annual storytelling show where returned Peace Corps volunteers actually get on stage in front of a live audience, tell a story about their service, and really, yeah, to, to share those stories so people can connect with a place that, that may, they may never be able to go. But stories really, you know, humanize places and countries and cultures. And I think that's part of our role as Return Peace Corps volunteers is to still shine a light on what our experience was like, where we were, and maybe even just help reframe the narrative um, at times. Right. That's beautiful. And so then how did you transition to Hope for Haiti? Yeah. So um, it was actually one of those, one of those things that was kind of random. I actually just saw a job posting and I looked up the organization and the more I read about the impacts of Hope for Haiti, and when I learned that actually the majority of our staff is Haitian, that really spoke to me. And I think part of that was also being a Peace Corps volunteer and really learning pretty quickly if you don't have the local community like directly involved and they themselves like leading the work and leading, you know, the the project or whatever you're doing, if you don't have those voices involved, you're not going to get very far. Like it has to be a partnership. Um, you know, I am not Haitian. I don't know what's best for Haiti, but my Haitian colleagues do. So really, um, my role is to help raise the resources and support so they can do that critical work. You know, for them, it's personal. You know, it's their communities, it's their country, it's their neighbors, it's their families. You know, that's who they're working for, and that's who they're working with. So for me, when I learned that, oh, almost all our staff is Haitian, th this is a group that I want to be a part of, um, and it is. It's a great organization. I. I can absolutely 100% attest to the work that my colleagues in Haiti are doing and that really makes a direct impact um, in the lives of the people who live in those communities. Now, I'll be honest, I know the name, but I don't really know what the organization does. So can you tell us what does Hope for Haiti do? What is that critical work that's being done? Yeah. So we focus on poverty alleviation and we truly believe that there's always a pathway to a better life despite the challenges. You know, we know that Haiti is not without its challenges, but we also know there's so much more to Haiti's story. You know, we also know how Haiti tends to be portrayed. It's poverty, corruption, natural disaster. But it doesn't stop there. We know there's so much more, so much more beauty, so much more positivity, so much more hope. So we work in four critical um, program areas, education, healthcare, clean water, and economic development. And we specifically partner with 24 communities in the south of the country. And our Haitian team implements programs in all four of those areas, because those are really what fit together when you talk about reducing poverty in a sustainable way. All right. That's awesome. And so one of my one of my friends is Haitian, one of my best friends, and he is this tech guy. Uh, when he mm -hmm. speaks, I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, uh, segmenting that into this, like, what kind of tools are you using? Are you using any Web3 tools to help you with your work over there? And do you see any impact in those tools? Yeah, so yeah. what we're doing in the Web3 space, you know, this is a new space for us, and it's something we've gotten really interested in. And I think one of the reasons we have decided to focus on sort of the Web3 technology 
once COVID hit and we saw that everything was moving, you know, in this virtual direction, and even now with everything opening back up, we see that that virtual world really is here to stay. So on the fundraising side, we've gotten into some really new interesting spaces, especially when we're talking about Web3. So a few years ago, I got personally very interested um, in virtual reality. I don't know if you've ever used one of the headsets, like the Oculus Quest. Not yet. Quest. Oh, they're fun. <laughs> um, so actually, I was in Manhattan, and I went to a place called VR World. And the whole right. thing is just different virtual reality experiences. So they have headsets. Each one is like a different game or something you can do. And I was blown away by the sophistication and the technology. But I couldn't get this question out of my head. So why are we not using this? Why is the nonprofit world not using this to really show impact and show our mission? I mean, when I was playing one of the zombie games, I had to take it off and put it down because I was so convinced, at least physically, that like zombies were chasing me. Like that's how scared I got. So thinking again, like if you can make someone really feel and experience like they're somewhere else on the impact side, that could be really, really powerful. Right. Um, so we actually partnered with a virtual reality studio called FXG, and they were able to actually take um, photos and blueprints of one of our partner schools in Haiti, along with photo and video of the Haitian landscape. And they were actually able to recreate that. CGI um, in VR. So it, I mean, for me, I was like, I don't know how this is going to work, but all right, let's try <laughs> it. But when you put on your headset, like you all of a sudden are looking at one of our partner schools. It's a three room right. um, classroom. You can walk into it. You can pick up a piece of chalk in VR. You can actually write on the chalkboard. You can look around the classroom. Um, when you go outside, you can actually pump one of our clean water wells that's also based off our, our wells in Haiti. You can raise and lower the Haitian flag all in VR. You can walk around the landscape. Um, one of the classrooms we've dedicated to just showing, uh, raising awareness about our work. So when you walk in, it's almost like sort of like museum style gallery. You can walk up to the walls and you can watch some of our organizational videos playing and for us, it's been a tool to really just tell Haiti's story in a different way, talk about our work in a different way. It's a social app. So I think up to 100 people can be in the app at once. So in theory, okay. we can start hosting events. So I think the, the possibilities um, are limitless there. It's just now, you know, figuring out the best way to use it. But it's something that we've been pretty excited about. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I can't wait to see that. So yeah. And now, where do you see this going? You say the possibilities are endless. Where do you see this going? Uh, do you see it as a, as a key tool in your, in your platform, in your endeavors? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of different things. For one, I'd love to start hosting events inside the app because, again, it's just a different way for us to talk about our work and to introduce people to our work and show people you know, a different side of Haiti and what we do. We've also thought about using it even... Um, for different groups. So thinking about in the past, we've done a lot of like lunch and learns with companies. A lot of that moved on to Zoom, but that's something we could host a group inside the app. Instead of having another Zoom call, it's like, you know what, if everyone on your team could get access to a headset, you could actually meet us inside, you know, this VR patient classroom. Uh, we've also presented at several conferences in the tech space because there's not that many nonprofits that are using VR. And my big dream is actually, if we can get the right partnerships, is to really think about, you know, beyond Hope for Haiti, how could we create like an impact metaverse? So um, people who are familiar with VR, there are these different platforms like Alt Space, um, Horizon Worlds, where you can meet and you can meet other people and you can go into these different worlds. But what if we had, you know, a whole like portfolio of nonprofit partners that each had their own space and then people were able to come in, you know, meet them, learn about their work, see the work in virtual reality, you know, ways to donate, um, ways to volunteer. I just think, again, like we're just sort of at the tip of the iceberg, you know, figuring all this out. Um, and I, I'm excited to hear that more people are getting interested in VR, getting interested in the metaverse, but also the applications that it could have. 
you know, not just for gaming, not just for, for social and entertainment, but really, again, for, for the cause world, for the impact world. Right. And I heard that uh, you created an NFT for Haiti, Hope for Haiti. Yeah. So actually, this goes back to our VR work, too. So um, last August, Haiti was hit by another devastating earthquake. And this time it was right in our backyard in August of 2021. Actually, I remember where I was. I was here in the U.S. and I was listening to the radio and it was on a Saturday and they said Haiti and earthquake in the same sentence. And I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, I hope it was like somewhere out in the mountains where there was no, you know, like devastation, loss of life. And then I heard that it was literally like outside of Lakai where we're based. Um, our 24 communities were all affected. Um, we have an all staff WhatsApp group that like blew up immediately. Our team was basically going door to door, making sure that like everyone was accounted for. Fortunately, they were. A lot of our staff, though, their homes were damaged. You know, they, they were victims of the earthquake themselves. And on top of that, they really became first responders. I mean, we've been working in Haiti for a long time. For better or worse, our team has dealt with natural disasters in the past. So now all our program areas, you know, all those needs are turned up. So the short term is getting food, water, shelter, you know, supplies out to the communities that are the most vulnerable and that were the hardest hit. Now we've moved into um, longer term response. So really helping rebuild some of that critical community infrastructure, including schools. Um, but at the time, so the, a year ago, we were finishing up the, the VR app with the studio and they actually said, hey, Sarah, you know, we know some NFT artists. What if they were able to like donate um, an NFT to Hope for Haiti to raise funds for your earthquake response? And I remember Googling, what is an NFT? Because at the <laughs> time, I was like, I, I don't right. know what any of this is. Um, and yeah, so we were able to partner um, with several artists and then, you know, raise some funds for earthquake response through NFTs. For me, that was was proof of concept. Like, okay, like this seems like it could be something significant. You know, there's a lot of buzz around NFTs. You know, I explain them just really more or less like, you know, digital art, you know, that people can purchase. Um, so now we've partnered with six just absolutely incredible Haitian artists. Um, and now we have a 900 piece NFT collection called Hope Endures that is available now. Um, each piece is unique and again, represented by six Haitian artists. And all that funding is actually going to rebuilding schools in Haiti. Nice. I like that. And, and and the fact that people are using their talent to be able to give back to a community need, that to me is yeah. amazing. And uh, yeah. I, like I, I was the same way. I had to Google what is NFT and I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I don't get this world, but it sounds cool. So mm -hmm. I need to figure it out. Right. So and now, little things like I know what they are, but it's so hard to explain, you know, non-fungible right? tokens. But, and, you know, it's an interesting use of blockchain and we're seeing that more and more nonprofits, since there was the big sort of like NFT explosion um, right. and back in like early 2021, um, right. what's cool was seeing NFTs being used for charitable causes. Exactly. And what I also really like about NFTs, and we're, we're talking about the art world, is, you know, traditionally an artist sells their piece. And then on the artist side, you know, that's it. That piece could increase in value, but the artist doesn't receive you know, any additional any, like right. proceeds but right. with NFTs, you can build something into what's called the smart contract, which kind of lays out how the sale works, the percentages. And every time an NFT is resold again, the artist can receive a portion of the sale. So for artists, I think that's just such a different and interesting way that blockchain can really support people's livelihoods. Right. Uh, it's almost like creating a royalty program in the blockchain for right. people in their right. art. I, I love it. So now what's next for like within the next five years? What do you see Hope for Haiti doing? What do you see the, crypt, the uh, NFT crypto world and blockchain? How do you see that merging together and what do you see happening on a bigger scale? Yeah, I mean, that, that's an exciting question. Um, something that I've 
been also really interested in. And again, if we can find the the right thought partners and, and those who want to build this with us is I love the idea of if there was a way to offer like tools, resources, and support. So Haitian artists in Haiti can also be minting their artwork um, into NFT. So thinking about just, you know, additional revenue streams that, that we may be able to to help partner um, to create those opportunities. But, you know, our team will continue working in our 24 communities. Like we've decided that that's strategically um, where, where we want to be in the south of Haiti. So continuing, you know, those partnerships in education. Um, we are, we have a very large healthcare clinic and healthcare program. We also run mobile clinics, you know, out in the rural areas. You know, we're always looking to to make sure that we're providing access to healthcare to as many people as possible. So making sure we're scaling that up. Um, clean water, you know, we wanna know that all 24 communities and families that we work with, you know, have access to clean water also at the household level and really growing our economic development program. Uh, we make loans and grants to businesses in Haiti that have a social impact. You know, we work with those entrepreneurs. So being able to increase the funding there, increase that pipeline, um, because that's everything fits together. Um, we see that, you know, families need to be able to pay those school fees so kids can access education. But, you know, that goes back to making sure that families have a livelihood have a way, you know, to earn money. And so again, everything just kind of clicks, clicks in place. All right. Well, uh, that's a good vision right there. One last question mm -hmm. for you. You're so passionate about this work mm -hmm. on the personal side. What do you do for fun? Oh, that's also a good question. So uh, we recently moved out of New York City and now we're in Connecticut and I finally own a kayak and a paddleboard <laughs> and I have really been enjoying both those things um All right. at least when I can stand upright on the paddleboard because that doesn't always happen <laughs> but yeah <laughs> learning learning how to not fall over is fun which I think is maybe a great metaphor for life too <laughs> there you go well thank you so much Sarah for your time it's yeah. been an interesting conversation uh i would like to follow up and find out more about your work and probably at some point put on that vr and see how live yeah. and I'll so give you um, a tour. Absolutely. there you go well thank you for your time and have a lovely day thank you you too